So 18 years ago, 21 years ago, how old am I? I'm 18. I know, I know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I may be seen all the So 18 years ago, this guy, we used to meet up there, upstairs, with your crew, like Zach used to come, yeah. and there was a couple other guys used to come, and you were a rock star. Yeah. You were the one I wanted to be. You remember, you were like a rock star, and now he plays while he's standing on the rock. Yeah. 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 He's a rock star, and now he's a plane he full of rocks. He's, a he loves rock. the rock. he's building his house on the rock. Yeah. He's got a beautiful Woo. life, he's got two gorgeous kids. Yeah. Four, four. 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 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can't build your house, but on the rock, Russell. Yeah. You better do it a lot more than playing the guitar, that's for sure. <laughs> Guy, beautiful kids, great guy, God bless you. you know, what, a, what a blessing you are to us, and he comes here all the time. Sometimes he comes with his kids and they play, you know? Yeah. And that's great. As a matter of fact, I told him, I said, we didn't want you, we wanted the kids. <laughs> <laughs> that's the great thing. So, so I, I get to introduce uh, Stevie, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, whenever I think about Stevie, I think about the phrase, Sharper than a serpent's tooth, the tongue, the tongue of an ungrateful child. <laughs> you know, and uh, I get these guys come up to me all the time. Whenever I do a meeting or something, they say, "We heard Steve the other day. Now, now we know where you get all your stuff from." <laughs> no, he's great. I got to be honest with you. The one guy I want to hear more than anything else, whatever he's, uh, is Stevie. I love listening to him. He's so great. And he loves the Lord. And his wonderful mother is here. God bless her, you know? And uh, I just love listening to him. And he also has a beautiful wife, Sandy, and a fantastic son, and you know? And it's just uh, great to see them. I'm so glad and he always comes here and he helps out. And he has this great uh, uh, place called JC's House where he helps a lot of people. A ton of people at JC's. I don't know how many JC's graduates we have here, but yeah, there they are. You know, they come up to me for, they, for years. He's been doing. They go, oh yeah, I'm a JC's guy. You know, and they're all over the United States. And everything. So I don't want to take any more time. I just can't wait to hear, hear what he has to say. And he has a great story. I, I will say one thing. I don't want to take from the story. This is probably going to be part of the story. But he, honestly, he doesn't. He's not truthful when he tells you. So, so I went to a meeting. I'm not going to give the whole thing to this part. I, I went to a meeting. I did some meeting in North Miami somewhere, and he was at the meeting. And uh, and I I think he came up to me afterwards and asked me to sponsor or something. He said something. I don't know. He was uh, you know you see him now. He's very cool. He's urbane. He's very well spoken. But he was. If you go back, how many? How long was he? He was sober. Twenty-one years. Twenty-one years. So if you flip back twenty one years ago, he was pathetic. <laughs> I just can't grasp another word, you know. I mean there's probably another word, but pathetic will do, you know, it's close enough for government word. And uh, all I know is the next day I'm sitting, I think Woody's watching this, Woody will vouch for this. Uh, he can't really vouch for this because he wasn't really well at the time. And, and uh, I get a call and he says, that guy's on the phone named Stevie. And he says, he met me and I met you yesterday. He says, he says, I'm, he says, I, I'm here in, in, in some Bible store and I'm looking at all the Bibles. And, and I said, who are you? He says, Stevie, this is Stevie. I met you and I'm looking at all the Bibles and there's a lot of Bibles and I don't know which Bible to get. And, Woody and I are like cracking up and where where is he? That's Woody. He looks like Abraham Lincoln. You know, you know, so and he's on the, and, and so we're cracking up. He says, So which Bible should I he said I said, I don't know whether I said or Woody says, the one that's in English. <laughs> English. So and the rest is AA history. The rest is uh, history of Christendom, you know, so I'm going to bring him up, but what is he, is he, I see him, he's right there, oh now, oh now I can see him, well, that's thrills, okay, so, oh, okay, come on Stephen, come on up,
Hi, everybody. My name is Stevie B. I'm a grateful, recovered alcoholic believer in Jesus Christ. It's so good to be here with everybody today. And, and I just want to tell you that uh, this is our, uh, Russell, is this our eighth year? Eleventh year? We've been, we've been doing this together for 11 years. And, um, and Pastor Woody's watching from home. And we've been, we have, Dice has been here with us 11 years. I've been blessed to speak here 11 times. And uh, it's just, it's amazing uh, that every time that I'm here, I get something else. You know, I'm, I'm in a different place than I was. We're all in a different place than we were just a couple minutes ago. We're all in a different place than we were this morning. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit knows exactly what we need. Is that uh, normal? I just want to make sure it sounds like it's about to explode. I don't know. <laughs> After Erica told that story, I'm a little bit paranoid. <laughs> I was going to throw some water on it and then it just turned out. I don't want anything to happen here. It doesn't sound uh, healthy in any way. He's going to pull the plug. So I, I, it's okay. I, 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 oh, no problem. Um, so I, I am blessed to be here with my mom. I, I, my mom has come. Um, and my mom and dad have come on uh, every single cross Florida we've ever had. Wow. We went from a Brickell Avenue, you remember, Jackie, and we went to another beautiful church, Cross Bridge. And now we're here where it started for me. This is the church that started for me in my Christian recovery because, um, as I always say, uh, not every, but most people won't get this. Okay, most people won't get this. You're going to have to do things extraordinary to get extraordinary results. And when I was in the recovery house, and I'll tell you how I got there, it was not a choice. It wasn't like I was excited to go to a halfway house when I owned a full house just down the street. But when I was uh, put in a halfway house by my, my wife, I didn't know what I needed was Jesus. My wife, my mom introduced me to Jesus when I was uh, like nine years old. And I had a relationship with Jesus as a, as a nine-year-old does, as a child does. And I read stories about Jesus and I had a, I had a jeans covered Bible, good news Bible, we were very Catholic. Um, and, I, and I'm not un-Catholic today, I'm just saying we were very Catholic uh, then. I had a little jeans Bible, it was called the good news Bible, it had a jeans for kids. So a corduroy cover like that type of thing, a jeans cover. And I read the Bible, but when I was searching in the Bible, I was always looking for the dirty stories. I, I was always a dirty story by God. Whereas uh, people that were on fire for the Lord, they were looking for Jesus stories. I was looking for anything that had to do with nakedness or lewdness or any type of idolatry or harlotry. I like the harlotry section of the Bible. I know my brother in the back, he agrees. We, we were always looking for the harlotry section. And uh, so I really never had a relationship with Jesus because I just thought it was a great story. I also like the story of Christopher Columbus. I think it's a great story. I love uh, Abraham Lincoln. I thought that was a great story too. I'm, I'm a big fan of all the great uh, pieces of literature, including the Bible. So when girls came around in my life in, in person, in, in, in uh in non-print form when I was 13 or 14. <laughs> I, I, so I, I quickly forgot about Jesus. I quickly forgot about the Bible. I quickly forgot about what my mother had taught me um, because uh, if it's a choice between it, uh, the Bible or, or living color uh, women, I, I, I definitely chose girls over the Bible and living color. So I was um, a non-practicing Christian for for years, years. And um, what I say that is that my dad is, was Jewish. He was a Jewish believer like Russell, okay? Um, like Al, Jewish believers like Sheldon. Believers that, that know that Jesus is the Messiah and the, 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 the Old Testament in the, in the Jewish part of the Bible, the Old Testament, uh, the Torah, uh, points towards the Messiah. We're, we're waiting for the Messiah. And, and, and the Messiah for us has come. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple minutes. And um, so that was attractive to me uh, that, uh, that I had the Jewish side of my family and then I had the Catholic side of my family. 
I, I'm more related to the Catholic side of my family because they were more around. My grandfather was around, my grandfather JC, who I eventually named our house after our JC house. Everyone believes it's for Jesus Christ, and it is, it is. But originally it was for my grandfather who gave me the money to open up something that, that meant something. And I opened up JC's house in honor of him and also my Lord and Savior. But I wasn't a believer uh, most of my life. You know, you know that, that's not true. I was a believer. I was a believer that anything that would affect me from the neck up or down. You know, we are not call it anonymous. We say anything that affects you from the neck up. But I was a believer in anything that affects me the neck up or neck down. Because <laughs> I have a lot, of, a lot of stuff that goes on from the head down, I want to tell you. For, uh, pretty much nothing uh, from the waist down. I'm, I'm good in that area. But, but really, anything that affected me from the waist up, I had a problem with. And I partake, just like most of us, in everything that would uh, affect me in a positive way mentally because I didn't feel good about myself. I had not, most people say they had low self-esteem. I had no self-esteem. I didn't who, know who I was. I uh, wanted to be everything that you were. Um, I was a chameleon. I wanted to just not be in my own skin. My mother and father told me they loved me and I didn't believe them. My grandparents told me they loved me and I didn't feel worthy. My uncle JG told me he loved me and I didn't feel worthy. So my whole life I was looking for a validation and even if you gave it to me, that wasn't enough because I didn't believe you. And how normal people get validation is through sports, but I wasn't good at sports. School, I wasn't good at school. A lot of you, like um, Erica said, she's um, phenomenal in school, and then, so she could get validation there. And, and Jackie's also good in school, so she could get validation there. But I didn't have that. So really the only validation that I, uh, that myself was through females, was through, through the opposite sex. And, um, and then of course through drugs and alcohol, because you, you could be the master of your ship, uh, with, 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 with drugs and alcohol. You, for, for a time there, you're powerful, right? That's why we do it. We become powerful. I believe, and I've never heard anyone talk about alcoholism as, as good as Russell. And is, is that, that's all, right? No, it's good? Okay. Is that I was an alcoholic before I ever took my first drink. I truly believe that I had alcoholism before I took my first drink. I believe that the first drink uh, was the cure for my alcoholism. I mean, I heard Russell say that once, and I was like, that is the most uh, um, amazing thing I've ever heard, that, that alcohol is, the, is actually the medicine for my alcoholism. I want to just tell you one little quick story when I was a, when I was a little kid. Um, always not feeling like I fit in, and that's going to give you a picture. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There is a God, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'll explain to you why that was driving me insane. And Russell will tell you that's a short drive, but I'm going to tell you why that was driving me insane. I, I, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to handle myself, and I thought that something was going on in my head because none of you could hear it, and I was like, I can't believe nobody can hear what's going on. I'm looking at you, and you guys are all like, that's fine. Daniel comes up, everything's fine. I'm like, something is not fun. That's not fine at all. It's highly disturbing. And I'm going to tell you why it's highly disturbing. I'm going to explain it to you right now. When I was 12 years old, and I felt like totally out of the place in my neighborhood, everyone had big brothers. I didn't have a big brother. And, um, and I thought everybody in the neighborhood was cool. I wasn't cool. I had a little, uh, you know, beautiful but chubby little sister. And, and I thought all my problems were because I didn't have big brothers. The coolest kid in my neighborhood, his name is Kevin. He was the toughest kid. He had the toughest big brothers. Everybody wanted to be like Kevin. So uh, when my mother was in the hospital with a terrible accident and my dad was at a, a funeral a parlor uh, arranging something for our family, I went and asked Kevin if he wanted to hang out with me. And Kevin said, why? Why would I want to hang out with you? And I said, because I have guns. And my dad being a, career, a, a Korean War hero, uh, and uh, we had guns. So that was something that was not regular in my neighborhood. The other kids didn't have guns, but I did. And this is the first time at 12 years old when nobody was home. And I told him if he came over my house, we'd blow stuff up. And as you guys know, guys, I, well, people like to blow stuff up. And so he came over, we blew stuff up. You know, like the hole in the bucket, so we're blowing stuff up, we're blowing can, uh, uh, holes in the cans and holes in the backyard. And then he got bored and he went to leave. 
And when he went to leave, I, I, I developed a pattern from, from early on till I was 34 that the, the uh, instantaneous gratification is far more surpasses the consequences of my behavior. And I said to him, if you don't leave, you can shoot at me and we'll play shoot at each other. And I, at the moment, I thought it was a great game. I thought maybe nobody had ever thought of the shoot at me game. And um, so I was exhibiting complete alcoholic behavior, and, I, and it had nothing to do with alcohol. And I gave him the gun, and, and, and in a one in a million shot, uh, he shot just like from right over there, and he shot my right eye out. No fault of his own. He's 13, I'm 12. Nobody thought he was going to really do anything. We just thought we were playing around, and we were playing around, but I lost my eye. I spent the next year in surgeries. This is part of the story I don't usually tell, but I wanted the dice to know why this was absolutely driving me insane. And a lot of that year, I had blinders on both eyes because they were trying to save my right eye. So my senses, uh, my, my two sen three senses are amazing. My, my sense of uh, hearing, uh, I'm super, absolutely sensitive. So that was like the loudest noise in the entire planet that was going on behind me. But I also have really great smell, which doesn't help in any way. I just want to let you know, unless you're a pig uh, for truffles, but so it doesn't help at all. And, and my sight is also very good. I get that from my, mo my mother and my one eye. Uh, but my senses are, are more elevated, right? So, so that would, that would uh, also enhance my alcoholism. Like, like Russell says, I was always very botherable. And, 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 then, and then being the kid that with the one eye, I, I was even more botherable. And then, and then also, and, then, and, and being the kid that's half Jewish and half Italian, but doesn't want to tell anybody he's Jewish, but then I would tell everybody I was 100% Italian, my last name was Boyarski, and that's always a big explanation how that happened. And so I was very botherable. And the moment I take one drink, which my first drink was Manischewitz Jewish table wine, for all the Jews in here, you know that's your favorite uh, wine probably also. Uh, or the Russians, it, it, it seems to be, uh, you know, a, a, a drink that is just, you know, wonderful, and it also is like grape juice with alcohol. The moment I took my my first drink, I felt at ease. The uh, big old Russell says that uh, nothing else uh, gives us the, the comfort that is alcohol. It's, it's it's instantaneous. It's instantaneous. I feel better instantaneously. And and I've always been searching for that my entire life to be instantaneously feel better. The alcohol works for me. I just want to share something with you. Alcohol works for me. If I could take one drink every day, one drink, I could go to the gym, I would take one drink. I'd go to work, I would only just take one drink. If I would uh, have interpersonal communication with you, I, I would think one drink would be fine. The problem is every other drink after that drink, it seems to be a problem. It causes a problem for me. And, and, that, and that, I believe, is, 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 is the problem, is, is, is the crux of the matter. So um, I'm just gonna fast forward, got sober very, very young, 21 years old, didn't have a relationship with Christ, uh, had a relationship with the Catholic Church, had a relationship with AA, been sober you know, many, many years, went to alcohol, synonymous, all that kind of stuff, all good stuff. I've been searching for something to fill this God-sized hole my entire life. If you know what I mean, restless, irritable, and discontent. Like I have a hole inside me, that one drink does fill, and it doesn't work instantaneously. I have a hole inside me that a sexual uh, entendre in my mind will help me for a second, and then doesn't work. I have a hole in my soul that I have a hole in my my, my chest that when I when I take a, an out a substance outside of me or even the gym, it works temporarily, and then all of a sudden the hole is greater because it was never intended for any of those things to be put into the hole. The only thing that has ever worked for me, really, permanently, in the instant, as fast as alcohol, as fast as drugs, is God. Amen. And coming to things like this, and hearing people like this, and hearing stories, and, and, and being around like-minded people, and iron sharpening iron, is, is the only thing that, that has ever worked for a, a kid like me. I, I go to, I go to uh, six or seven meetings a week, and I need them. I need every one of them. How I, how I got to be a believer, because uh, I want to just give you the short verse, how I got to be a believer is I was seven years clean without Jesus. I was seven years clean, I didn't use the word sober, I was seven years clean without a close and personal relationship with God. 
What does that mean? Raise your hand if you know me in here. Raise your hand if you know me or if you ever heard me speak before. Okay? And so I know David and, and I know his wife, but I just know them from meetings. So I, I wouldn't, I, I know them, but I don't really know them. I don't know what she likes to eat. I don't know her favorite color. I don't know what they do on the weekends. I know them from meetings. They're very, very nice people. Very good looking people. I like good looking people. <laughs> but I don't really know them. So for me to say I have a relationship with them, that would be erroneous. It's not true. I don't have a relationship with them. I thought I had a relationship with God, and I know them like I know David and his wife. I knew of them like Christopher Columbus. I knew of them. I knew of God. Sorry, I knew of God like I know about Abraham Lincoln. So I'm in AA seven years, and I don't have a relationship with God. And so what happened was alcohol was not the problem. I had a problem before alcohol. Once I took the alcohol away, that didn't fix the original problem. I was 12 years old and I gave a kid a gun and said, shoot at me. My original problem is not going to be fixed with alcohol and it's also not going to be fixed by taking alcohol out of the equation. I had a problem before I drank. Taking the drink away is not going to fix the original problem. Hence, the bigger problem. So I'm five years clean and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm three years clean and I'm, I'm trying to date everyone in the program. Uh, you know, I'm trying to have extra uh, affairs everywhere. I wasn't married, I was gonna use extra amount of, I was just having, I was just trying to have extra dating affairs, you know, through the entire program. I thought the program was like Max.com. I was really trying to <laughs> use that free uh, dating uh, websites because there was no websites. And, and, um, and I just got sicker and sicker and sicker. And so I figured if I got bigger, so I took more steroids, and I, and I, and I got uh, larger, and then I wanted to be a gym owner, and, I'm, and uh, I'm going to meetings with my shirt rolled up, and I have these big arms, and, and, and I'm just getting sicker, so I go out and buy a sports car, and that doesn't work, so I go out and buy a $50,000 Lincoln Navigator, and that doesn't work, and I'm just, I'm just stark raving, absolutely dripping with alcoholism, sober. And I see this beautiful woman in a circus, and she comes riding in on an elephant, and she's from Colombia, and she's Latina, and she's hot, and she's in a circus, and I fall in love. And I figure if I get her, if I can meet that girl, everything should be fine. Because that looks like that's going to fix this God-sized hole, right? And, and you know what I'm saying, Erica, because you're Latina. And then, um, <laughs> so I, I go, and, and, I, and I ask her to date me, and, and, and she dates me, and, and, uh, and, and for a while, I got better. On the outside, it felt like I got better. And then, I, but I didn't get better. And so we're on our honeymoon, and uh, in the next table next to us, in our honeymoon, uh, is people drinking fine wine. And I had never seen that. <laughs> I had never seen a fine wine presentation. Sheldon looks like he had, knows about fine wine. He like he's seen a lot of fine wine in his time. I did not see a lot of fine wine in my time. Uh, so when I saw people in the next table, uh, that were that had fine wine on the table, but they weren't drinking it. I I was you know pretty shocked. So I said to the food server, "What are they doing?" She said, "They're drinking fine wine, and fine wine needs to breathe first. And I had never heard of something like that. So I said, "It needs to breathe first. Is it that they're doing a fine wine presentation?" And and I was like, "That I I could do that. I think fine wine. I could do fine wine." I, I, I basically went from Mad Dog 2020 to crack and I missed fine wine. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is my section over here. That's the fine wine section, this is the crack section. I, I see my people. And so I, at that moment, I, I, I realized I was not powerless over fine wine that needed to breathe first. And if you don't believe that you're powerless over your first uh, drink or drugs you're gonna use again. If you don't believe you're powerless over sin, you're going to do that again. If you're, if you're not uh, feeling like God doesn't care, you're going to do whatever you want to do. If you don't believe in the verse where it says that God honors those that honor Him, you're not going to honor Him. I didn't know anything uh, other than uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And then now, instantaneously, because I believed I could drink fine wine, now I didn't even believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. So now I don't have a relationship with God, and I don't have a relationship with Alcoholics Anonymous because I planned that that day, even though it took two more years, that I was going to drink. And I married this beautiful girl, unsuspecting. She thought I was sober, and all I was was clean, and I wasn't sober. And within a year and a half, I was already drinking and drugging and doing everything that I had did when I, in my 20s, and now I was already 32 years old, and our entire life fell apart. 
She came to the country of the United States from Colombia, where they make my drug of choice, and she married a cocaine addict here. That's not really a good thing that, that to do. And so she served me with a restraining order and, uh, and asked me to leave the house by the help of the restraining order. And, uh, I, and I went to go live in a halfway house. And which, as I already told you, was not something that I had ever, you know, envisioned. You, when, you, when you're a kid, you say, I want to play baseball, I want, I want to be a judge, I want to be a doctor. No, I want to live in a halfway house. It's not one of the big aspirations of life. And so I'm living in this halfway house. I don't even know how I got there. I, you know, like two weeks later, I was living in my own house. Now I'm in a halfway house with Stinky Feet Mason, Big Eddie, and Todd that uh, chew tobacco from Texas. And, um, and, I, and I don't know how I got there. And, and, and this is the miracle. Here's the miracle that, like, like Cody spoke about the miracle. Russell, as unassuming and as, uh, as innocent as he may look, is a warrior for kicking down the walls in the kingdom of darkness. He, he's a warrior for uh, making a statement for Christ in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had no idea. I had no idea because I was just going to a meeting to stop smoking crack. Because now I was back in the crack from 15 <laughs> years earlier. Now I'm, I'm in new crack. I don't know if you know there's new crack, there's old crack. I was in new crack. <laughs> and I walk into the meeting and I was driven by my dad. I was driven by my dad because I just had a six felony car crash on December 18th. And when, by the time my dad took me to the meeting on January 3rd, I had already uh, been involved with the law, six felonies, the whole thing. I never had any felonies. I got six right off the bat, which I think is overachieving. And, <laughs> and my dad drove me to the meeting, and then Russell did this amazing thing, which I did on Thursday night. Michelle, I don't know if you remember on Thursday night what I read, which was Luke 10. I brought the Bible out this week, Russell, uh, in, with, with Luke 10. Al was there. Some of you guys were there. The reason I brought the Bible out of Luke 10 is because a man that helped save my life brought out the Bible, Luke 10, when I was a couple hours sober. Amen. And he talked about being the Good Samaritan. I had never seen anything like it. I never even heard anybody talk about the Bible inside alcohol to was. And I did witness one time my pastor's brother, who was not my who was not my pastor at the time because I wasn't a Christian. I witnessed later on I, I joined a church and that pastor I met his brother and I was like, oh my God, you're the guy that came to AA and everyone threw you out. I had seen someone bring a Bible in AA once and they and they asked him to leave because why? He wasn't a member of AA. If you're not a member of AA and you come in with a Bible, they, they, they could you know, literally uh, do, just do terrible things to you. Uh, <laughs> but Russell brought the Bible out in AA and I was like, wow. There is a different Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a different program. There's a different God. I was following a God of my misunderstanding. I was following a God that was okay with me going to strip clubs. I was following a God that was okay with me watching The Sopranos religiously every Sunday night, no matter what. I was, I was following a God of my misunderstanding. And I walk in and Russell talks about the God of the universe, the spirit of the, the God of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was shocked. And afterwards, we were walking out with my dad, and I said, I said, man, if I could get a sponsor like that, that would change my life. And he goes, well, why don't you ask him? I said, dad, that's a circus people. You should just walk up to a circus people and ask him. <laughs> but like, as he was walking out, just like a regular guy. You know, he, like, he didn't even have like a fancy card, like an like, old Cadillac. I'm like, well, maybe I can ask him. I don't know. I just walk up, and he seemed like a regular guy. He says, could, I, could you be my sponsor? And he's like, yeah, call me tomorrow. And I go, wow, that was a lot easier than I thought. <laughs> And then I called him to the next day, not from a Bible store, because I certainly wouldn't know a Bible store. I walked, I was in Barnes and Noble, and I asked him, what's your Bible to buy? I called him up from Barnes and Noble. There's a whole section of Bibles. You gotta know what you're doing in that type of section. You don't just walk in there unassuming and then I'm gonna buy a Bible. So I called him up like a, like a good sponsor. He would do the next day. I asked him, he told me to buy one in English. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Already I knew that abuse was about to start from him and Woody. And that started my journey. My mother had introduced me to Jesus. There was a guy, Tommy Esposito, that came to the swap shop who owned a Christian bookstore called Cornerstone Bookstore in Fort Lauderdale. He mentioned Jesus. There's been many people over the years, Mrs. Fitzmaurice, my fifth grade teacher, she mentioned Jesus. A lot of people God had sent my way to mention Jesus. Like that story about uh, the, the man that was in the, the hurricane and uh, he was a believer. And uh, they said to him, you, you need to come with us right now. 
uh, because there's a hurricane coming and, it's, and, you, and you're going to possibly die here. And he goes, no, no, I got this. God's got this with me. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going I'm to stay and I'm going to watch my house. Everything's going to be fine. God got this. And he stayed. And then a couple hours later, the water was rising. And then uh, a man comes by in a boat and he says, jump into the boat. I, I, I'm here to help you. I'm here to save you. And he goes, no, no, God's got this. <laughs> and then a couple hours later, the, the water's up to the roof. And he's on the roof, and a helicopter comes by, and he says, hop into the helicopter. And the goes, guy goes, no, God's got this. And then he dies and goes to heaven, and, and, and he goes, God, what happened to you? He goes, I sent you a boat. I sent you a guy. I sent you a helicopter. I mean, what, how much more did you need? But what did I need? I needed a guy in AA that cursed like a sailor that night. I haven't liked it since then. To talk about... Luke 10, in the Bible that I hadn't read since I was a little kid, and when I read it when I was a little kid, I looked for stuff that was inappropriate in the Bible. And he talked about Luke 10 being the Good Samaritan, and something happened, the scales from my eyes fell off. And I didn't become born again for another two months, just like Sheldon didn't become born again until uh, the 17th year of his sobriety. It took time because I didn't, still didn't believe it. And I didn't want to hang out with you guys. And I agree with Cody. This is not something I want to do. I, I, I don't want to hang out with other Christians. I don't want to put my hands up. I don't want to do any of that nonsense. But it's not, I had no choice because eventually I did become born again. But what happened to me was that man, Russell Spatz, kicked down a wall, a wall in the kingdom of hell. And when, uh, when he kicked down that wall, I was standing there. And I want to share something with you. It, this whole conference, we used to have about 350 people come to this conference. Jackie will tell you, and James will tell you, we, 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 we used to have lots of people come to this conference. And I believe that this conference next year could be 350 people again. I was talking about like a young, cool, good-looking guy. I'm like, we need help down here in Miami to get this to where it used to be. But even if next year we have 15 people less and one person gets saved, the entire conference is worth it. Amen. And I'll tell you why. In every single meeting, in every single conference, in every single time we get together, there's a Russell Spatz, there's a Stevie B, there's a Jackie, there's an Erica, there's a David, there's a Cody. There's, there's somebody that's going to go and spread the message and kick down the walls when yeah. Satan is yeah. in the house. You don't know who that's going to be. You don't know in this, Zach Bear could be the one that in 21 years is telling the story here and we're kicking down the walls. So you got to keep preaching the gospel. You got to keep telling people about the Lord. It's not about the masses. Do, do Russell and I, would we would end dice, would we rather speak to 500? Yeah, we like crowds. We like the energy of a crowd. But like Cody said, one-on-one -on -one is just as good if someone's going to get the message that God reigns and he sent his son for us. The original recovery program, the original recovery program, before Salvation Army, before Alcoholics Anonymous, before Narcotics Anonymous, the original recovery program was sent because of two people. It was because of Adam and Eve. The original recovery program, because Adam and Eve made a decision to eat a fruit, and at that time we were going to be separated from God forever. The original recovery program is called John 3.16. Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that for whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Amen. If right. one person here today right. gets saved, if one person makes a decision for Jesus today, that's why God sent his son, his only son. Because we were never going to be in the kingdom. I've had inappropriate thoughts in this church today. <laughs> I'm never going to get to the kingdom on my own thought process. Amen. That's right. I can't make it through a Christian recovery conference in Cutler Ridge. Come on now. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. And he has her. He has because he sent his son. So this is what I want to share with you. A couple months later, my wife, someone invited her to church. And I want to share with somebody, if you're not going to church, go to church. I don't care what denomination you are, I don't care how you grew up, it doesn't matter to me, your background, your belief system. I was Catholic and Jewish, and really what that meant is I was confused. 
And my wife, someone invited my wife to go to church. And my wife invited me to go to church. Now, she didn't tell me it was church, but when I got there, I found out it was a church. <laughs> it didn't look like a church to me. This looks like a church. This, I would have smelled this out and saw this was a church. But she brought me to a non-denominational box type of church that looked more like a college with a bookstore and a ca cafe, and I was duped. <laughs> And when I got inside that non-Catholic church, which I had never been in a non-Catholic church in my entire life, because if you know anything about Catholics, we don't go to non-denominational churches, because we may not go to church, but we certainly don't go to your church. <laughs> it's kind of in the doctrine. And when I got there, I thought the whole thing was hokey. Now, Russell had told me about the Bible. I bought the Bible. My mom's been telling me about the Bible. But until you ask Jesus into your heart, listen to what I'm saying. I know David and his wife, but I don't know them. Until you physically and spiritually and mentally ask Jesus into your heart, all you're going to be doing is being a spectator. And the difference between a spectator and a person that plays in the game is that people that play in the game make a difference. And spectators watch. Until that day, until that church service when the pastor said, would you like to come up and give your life to Jesus and exchange your whole life for new? And I had been there the week before, and the week before I had faked it because I was hoping that my wife was going to not put me back in the halfway house. So she gave her life to Jesus, and I went up and faked it. But how do you fake it? When you, she went like this, I went like this, she went, ooh, I went like, ooh. <laughs> the pastor said, would you like to give your life to Jesus? I'm like, hallelujah, because I saw my wife say hallelujah, and I faked the whole thing and nothing happened. But the next week, something happened. All right, come on. And there was a woman that was there, a famous, a famous woman, that, and she sang uh, the song, you changed me, you changed me. And I went up, not knowing what I was about to do, not knowing that this one time, in this one day, at this one moment, was gonna change everything for the rest of my life. I didn't do it for that. I do it because, I did it because the Holy Spirit, who I didn't know, already had a calling on my life. The Bible says that unless you a person is called, all this is gonna sound like foolishness. And I'm telling you, if you're here today, you're already called. And the, and the pastor said, would you like to come up and exchange your whole life for your new life? And I went up and I, and I said a prayer that I'm going to lead you in a couple minutes. I'm going to lead you in the same prayer. If you want to say it, you can leave here today born again. Amen. Amen. The big book says we were reborn. Did I know I needed to be reborn? No. Did I know that I needed to, to have a Savior? No. But at that moment, something happened to me that changed not only my life down here, but changed my eternity. I'm going to be hanging out with Jesus someday. I'm going to be hanging out with my dad, Stan, who was a Jewish Russian Jew who left this planet saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yes. I'm going to be hanging out with Jesus someday for eternity. That's right. And I said a prayer and I asked Jesus into my heart. And then the fruit just started happening in my life. The fruit started happening. I started a recovery Bible study that's still going on to this day. One of the reasons it's still going on today is that man in the back. We were in a little church. We had like 15 people going to it. We weren't even in a church. We were like in a, in a mission that was like, like, like a church. And it, was a, a, and it was like for drug addicts that were coming out of drugs. And, and it was called the St. Francis Mission. And we had like 15 people. Michelle's son was the, one of the 15 people. Uh, Michelle Williams' son was one of the 15 people. And she said, and he said, listen, if we get this guy Dice to come and play music here, man, this is going to change everything. And I'm like, well, we're good. I, we, have the, we have this little uh, boom box from Walmart <laughs> with a cassette in there. I go, I think we're good because I didn't know anything about Christian music. So we were playing like, uh, we, we weren't praying on me, Marie. We were praying uh, Amazing Grace. We had the Amazing Grace before the meeting, and then we would open up with, with the Bible, and then we'd have a little bit from uh, Sermon on the Mount, I thought we were just rocking it. <laughs> and he said, well, let me invite my friend Dice. And I'll tell you, Dice and I have been doing this so long that Dice, and I, that ain't, and like 17 years ago, Dice looked like Japanese Fabio. <laughs> he had long, flowing hair. It was unbelievable. 
Like the most unbelievable hair you've ever seen. With with like, you know, like 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 the faint, like the I don't know what you call it, it was feathered. And he had muscles coming out of muscles, and he walked down that aisle of that St. Francis mission with the guitar, and it was almost like the light had followed him inside the room. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is gonna change everything. Turn the boombox off. <laughs> And he started playing out our recovery Bible study and people came and we had a famous musician by the name of Dion who loves Jesus and he came and Dice was with us for years and he brought a huge following and, 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 and then a guy named Jerry Sharp who's just an amazing Christian that led Dice to Christ out of, in an alcoholic to me, not to me because he never says, he always says yes to Jesus. He came and then once he came, once we had Dice and, and Jerry Sharp there, that was like the Beatles had been put together. <laughs> And the thing was, was growing exponentially. And then Russell would make announcements that we had great things going up in Broward County. And things just continued to grow and grow and grow. And this is what I want to share with you. And, and, we, and now, listen, and now, now they're not growing. Now they've, now they've faded back to, 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 to not so many. Like in the recovery Bible stuff, maybe we have like 50 on a, on a Wednesday night. But guess what? We don't stop. Right. We don't stop. We were at 250. Now we're at 50. We don't stop. The message has never changed that Jesus saves. The message has never changed. He, he'll, he'll take your life, and, 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 and it's not that he promised you that it's not gonna be difficult, because some of you guys know the story, some of you know we lost our only baby. We, all, we lost our only unborn child uh, through a miscarriage. And I didn't see that coming. We had tried for years and years and years. We had tried surrogate. We tried, we tried um, getting eggs donated. We tried everything. We were finally pregnant and then we had a miscarriage. And, and we, I did not see it coming. And we were devastated and we had a baby's room built in the house. And nothing can prepare you for that. Not when you're 42 or 43 and you believe this is it. You believe God blessed you. And then you go in and then you bring the, 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 the tape and then the, the nurse comes out and she says, I'm sorry. You don't, you, nothing can prepare you for that. But God still had a plan. And God still has a plan. Yes. What, what, what is it? What is it, Michelle? God has a plan. What, and what's the other one? Expect a That's right. Expect a miracle. Amen. Expect a miracle. Amen. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. And that's just not a cliche. That's not a cliche. I'm telling you. That is the truth. That is the truth. That's not a cliche. When you're down to nothing, that's when God's going to do his best works. Yes. And God introduced us to this beautiful man by the name of uh, Happy Bob in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he had a friend that was an attorney. And that attorney, who was a Jewish woman, came to our house. And by that time, we had like Giant Jesus in the house. And we have, you, you know Giant Jesus. You're there right now. Stay with me. Giant Jesus is still there. And I said to Sandy, Sandy, should we take Giant Jesus down since this woman's Jewish and maybe this is going to offend her? She goes, we're not going to, we're not going to pretend who we're not. Mm. And she signed off on the adoption papers in about... I don't know, a little bit later, a little bit short, short after that time, we got a call from the top of the United States in a state that has a reciprocal relationship with Florida because I, I can't adopt a baby in Florida. I can't adopt a baby in Florida, but God doesn't care about that. God did his supernatural work and introduced us to a woman by almost by Canada, by in California area, and, and says, come in, come in, I want to meet you guys. My wife is Colombian, she's dark. I, I, I'm a guinea from Florida and, and New York. <laughs> She's like the whitest white person you've ever met. And they invite us to come up and possibly adopt her baby. Wow. And we get there and she holds up this ultra white baby. <laughs> and, and, and she's like, would you, what would you like to name your son? Wow. And we say Joshua. Wow. And she yeah. says, why Joshua? And we say, because in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. And Joshua is white, white, ultra white, <laughs> and no hair. And about nine months into his beautiful life, he springs the most gorgeous red hair. Wow. God is good. And he looks exactly like my mom. God is good. He looks exactly like my mom. When my wife and I would go pick him up at, at, nursery, at, the, at the nursery and at the school, we'd have, they asked us for three forms of identification. <laughs> When my mom goes picks them up, they're like, Mrs. Boyarski, come right in. It's your grandson, obviously. 
God is always looking to show off. God is giving you signs all the time. Yes. God is giving you signs right now. Get off the bleachers. Yes. Stop being a spectator and get into the game. Watch what happens. If you think that you know the rest of the story, you don't know the rest of the story. I have been speaking around the world with alongside that man, Russell, because when he finishes a speaking engagement and, and the next year they're looking for somebody, he says, well, we'll call Stevie, he'll do it. I've been all over in different countries. I've been in, it, it's just been amazing. Last, just a couple months ago, something really cool happened. And because of Russell, because he had COVID, he told this one committee to invite me. They invited me out to Wisconsin. I went out to Wisconsin to speak. And while I was there speaking, um, they invited me back. Wow. Cody was there. We all met out there. We had an incredible time. They invited me to come back and speak in Wisconsin. The same exact weekend, listen to this, of all the places in the United States, they also asked Russell to speak at a different conference, and we went out there at the same time in Milwaukee. What is that? Two Jews from Florida are in Milwaukee speaking at different conferences, and I got to speak on the Friday night meeting and then run across town with Cody and, and go be there with my sponsor and who and Rachel and Rachel. We were all hanging out there together in Wisconsin. On the same weekend. He wants to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you ever can possibly imagine. I want to read this to you. Saturday evening, when Sabbath ended on March 16, Mary Magdalene, mother of the mother, and Mary, the mother of James and Solomon, went out and Siloam went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way there, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone when we get there? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee, and you will see him there, just as you were told before he died. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Then briefly later, reported to this, oh, they reported to Peter and his companions. Afterward, Jesus himself sent them out from east to west with the sacred and failing message of salvation that gives eternal life. Brothers and sisters, I want to share something with you. This is the day the Lord has made. If, if you have not asked Jesus Christ into your heart, or you've been wavering, you haven't been doing anything, you've been sitting on the sidelines, you know there's more to do, you know that you've been called for a reason, you're not just here by coincidence, you, Jackie said it, Erica said it, Cody said it, amazing speakers, unbelievable today. Every speaker was just incredible, and they all had the same message. If you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. If you're not born again, you're not going to fulfill your purpose here on planet Earth. Your purpose is not to fill your purse with all different types of monies. Your purpose is to have salvation, and salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Listen, Amen. Jesus is alive. Yes. Yeah. Jesus yes. is alive. He's not in the tomb anymore. You have an opportunity right now. You can come up here right now. And I'm, and not like this, you do it in your seat and, and, and whisper it in your chair. You have an opportunity. Listen, when, when I found out there was good cocaine in Miami, I traveled here. <laughs> I didn't sit up in Broward and hope that someone was going to deliver it to me. I came down to the source. And I want to thank you, David, for that. I came down to the source. <laughs> And I want to ask you, if you want to be, if you want to be born again, if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, if you want to change your life and your eternity, if you, if you, if you want to rededicate, I'm going to ask you right now to come back, to come up here. Yes. I'm going to ask you right, usually we have music, usually we have a whole thing going on, but right now I'm going to ask you to come up. Come up right now, right in the front. Right here. Jump. Come right here. Come up right now. Come up right now. Come up right now. Come up right now. Yeah. Yes. Come up right now. If, if you know that 
there's more. If you know that you have been believing but you have not been participating, don't sit inside the pews. Come up right now. We do this prayer together. You can rededicate or ask for the first time. You want to leave here today knowing that you're born again. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. Let's we'll stay here all the while. We will stay here all yes. We will stay here all day. If there's one, listen, if you're born again, raise your hand. If you've asked Jesus in your heart, raise your hand. If you know you're going to heaven, raise your hand. I hope everybody's raising your hand. I don't want to get to heaven and find out that one person in here went to hell because they didn't get born again today. I want to ask you a question, guys. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died for you? Would you like to do a sinner's prayer with me? Amen. So repeat after me. What is your name? My name is Mark. Mark, nice to meet you. Dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me. And you rose again. I've made a decision today to follow you now and for the rest of my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to wash me clean, to give me the power of your Holy Spirit so I can live differently, so I can live for you. And I pray this all in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Guys, I want you to know something in heaven right now. Heaven is rejoicing. Heaven is rejoicing because when one person, and, uh, and they may have been born again before this, but they know for sure that they're born again now. Amen. Because it's by our belief system in Jesus Christ, only by Him, that we become born again. So let's congratulate them one more time. Bibles, do what Russell does, go and kick down some walls in, in hell because I'll tell you something, the devil is running scared. And, and if you're going through persecution, let me finish with this, if you're going through persecution in your life right now, that's a good sign. That's a good sign that you're making a difference, isn't that right Al? That's a good sign that you're making a difference. Because the enemy is afraid of you, Erica. The enemy is afraid of you, Jackie. The enemy is afraid of you, Cody. The enemy is afraid of you, Sheldon. The enemy is afraid of Russell because he does not like us to get free. As in John 8, 38 and 8, 36, when the Son sets you free, you'll be free. God bless you guys.